Hi, my name is Ginger Annis, Veteran Service Officer for Alexander County. Did you know there are approximately 850 World War II service men and women passing away each day? Each of these service personnel have a story, a story about friendships, families, experiences, and achievements. The Veterans Service Office, in cooperation with the Alexander County Government Channel, will be hosting, in a series, several short stories shared by these courageous veterans. So sit back and enjoy our history, our heroes. My name is Ginger Annis and I am the Veterans Service Officer for Alexander County and I'm here today with Phil Bowman. Uh, Phil, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Welcome to Eden, Ginger, by the way. Thank you. We're doing this at my home. <laughs> uh, uh, my name is Philip Bowman. I was born in Iredale County, but I have been an Alexander County resident. When I was born, no kids were born in Alexander County. Everybody's born in Iredale. But my parents were Rayford and Amelia Bowman and lived here all their lives. My father was a war, World War II vet. Uh, my grandfather was Ott Dyson, whose land this was at one time, my grandmother's. Uh, Ott and Emma Dyson and my other grandparents were Eve and uh, Lottie Bowman. And I have a lot of relatives in the county here. Uh, my father had 19 brothers and sisters and my mother had 13. so. I'm related to a fair number of people in the county, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, family is family's good. We, we love our family. So, uh, but uh, I went to Taylorsville High, which preceded Alexander Central, and uh, played sports and had my 15 minutes of fame uh, playing football. And my senior year, lost uh, my knee to a football injury and my scholarship to college. And uh, then went on to Gardner-Webb College, graduated from there, and uh, after graduation from Gardner-Webb, not being sure of what I wanted to do with my life, not wanting to waste my father's money, which I was probably spending too much time in Gaffney at their local beer joints, but uh, I decided I should decide what I wanted to be before I went back, so having graduated. Neglected to think about losing college deferment and the possibility of the draft. Uh, but uh, they needed school teachers in Alexander County, and a friend suggested I give school teaching a thought. So I uh, applied for a job uh, and got hired to be a school teacher at Happy Plains Elementary and High School, which is now Paul Robert Chair. And oddly enough, after I uh, I came back and started working for DSS, was the first place I worked as a DSS, that was our office. But I taught school for a year at Happy Plains, I took the teacher's exam and made high enough for an A certificate, but with two years of college I taught on a C certificate. Uh, taught fifth and sixth grades, uh, my first year out, no practice teaching, no anything, just jump in and, and teach. So I tried to, uh, being fully aware that it was the last year that the school was going to be in existence, we tried real hard to prepare the kids as much as we could for the transition to uh, Taylorsville High School. Um, but after that, I was going back to Lenore Run um, on a grant to get my full certification and teach and received Uncle Sam's notice that they wanted my services. And uh, looking at what was going on, as, as Mr. Parker you interviewed earlier, uh, mentioned quite a bit about landmines and, and the problems of walking on the soil there, decided I did not want to do that, so I talked to my local recruiter and she had a program that she said, a warrant officer candidate school. And I said, well, what is that? And she said, well, you fly helicopters. And I said, I might could do that. That you know, beats walking out in the jungle. So I yeah. then joined uh, for that program, uh, went to basic training at Fort Polk, Louisiana which incidentally was the first time I ever was off the ground and flew uh, going to flight school. Uh, so we flew to Fort Polk, did basic training, uh, armpit of the world. Uh, from there we bussed down to Fort Walters, Texas for our uh, beginning of flight school. Uh, you would fly half a day, you would have class half a day. And this was where they tried to wash you out. And they told us their purpose there would be 
if we can flunk you out or wash you out of this program, we're going to. Uh, and I think it ended up being 50 or 60 percent washout rate or something like that. But you were harassed 24-7. All these TAC officers had been to Vietnam. Uh, they were back in the States either waiting to go back to Vietnam or had been, uh, some of them, out on injuries and all. But they delighted in making our lives a living hell. Um, I mean, you, we went in, we were living in old uh, World War II barracks at Fort Walters. The floors and the buildings was just like open barns. So we literally took razor blades and scraped the entire floor of both floors of the building. Then you buffed and waxed it a couple of times a day. Uh, but every part of your display, and, and this is for people go to OCS or any other school, you went through this or worse if you were guys who were SEALs or uh, different schools. But for us, it was just mental harassment and physical harassment. Uh, because you got inspected and you had to keep every uh, item in your display precisely at the right mark. Um, anyway, finished uh, Fort Walters. Uh, from there, we went to Fort Rucker, Alabama for flight instrument training and for transition to the Hueys. Uh, a delightful place simply because it was close to Panama Beach, Florida. Uh, but uh, there was a lot to be said. You made a lot of friends. Uh, for us, it was fun. I was young. I was adventurous. I'd read a lot of stories about all these things and happenings, and here I was living it. So for me, it was, it was fun. Uh, I was close enough that I could come home occasionally, fly home. Uh, but after finishing up at Fort Rucker and getting our wings and our warrants, uh, we had a 30-day leave, and most people generally went straight to Vietnam after that, but at the time, they were transitioning to the Vietnamization of the war, so the demand for pilots had decreased somewhat, so I was assigned to Fort Bragg, uh, North Carolina, with the 82nd Airborne Division uh, for, I think I spent seven months there. Uh, which was fun. I got to dress up with my boots bloused and all the paraphernalia. And went well with the girls at that time, the ones who weren't spitting on Vietnam veterans, which I wasn't yet. Um, but after uh, six or seven months at Fort Bragg, then I got my orders for Vietnam. And uh, uh, the one thing I actually prayed for uh, going over was that I didn't get sent to I Corps, II Corps, or places with mountains because getting shot down or flying in the mountains. It's just another uh, problem you've really got to worry about because they will kill you as much as bullets do. And there's not any places to auto-rotate if you have engine failure. So um, I got lucky. I guess you could say lucky. Anyway, I was assigned uh, to the Delta, four core, uh, in Venlong, which was on the split of the Mekong River in between those. Uh, beautiful location, um, hot. As, as Tom mentioned in his interview with you, uh, you, I'm sure, having been to the places you have been, are aware of heat. Vietnam was somewhat different from the desert heat just simply because of the amount of humidity that was in the air, especially with the water all around you. You could literally sit in front of a large fan with your shirt off in the shade and continue just to pour sweat. Uh, so you had to drink a lot of water, and they can give you salt tablets and malaria pills. Mosquitoes were atrocious. They could pick you up and hover almost. Uh, so you, every night to sleep, you sprayed down with off that your parents and friends sent you. Uh, and, and literally, you, you still slept with them buzzing around your ears. Um, but um, Vietnam was a unique visit. Uh, the University of Southeast Asia taught you things you wanted to know, you didn't want to know, you never cared to know. Uh, but things that one way or another, if you survived, did make you stronger and more understanding of how the world works. Because war, as hu and, and my hobby is the study of human beings and how we build and develop societies. And In college I, I majored in sociology and religion after I came back. But getting ahead of the story but man has been at war and killing each other since Cain and Abel and for me the search has been how do we find a way of living that we can all agree on and get along because we live literally 
in a virtual paradise that we are destroying at such a phenomenal rate without a thought in the world of what you leave your children and your grandchildren and what it's doing to us physically, mentally, and spiritually by destroying our own homeland. Um, and we will have to address this. Um, and we'll not go into that right now. We're talking about this. Uh, so where do we go from here? You, you'd lead us on. Uh, okay. Um, can you relate any skirmishes or battles that you were involved in when you were flying? Uh, I suppose the best story I have, or one of the best. Uh, my second month there, uh, the one, I was with the 114th Aviation uh, Company. Um, we had two platoons, the White Knights and the Red Knights. Uh, I was initially assigned to the White Knights, but they were the quiet guys who didn't drink and didn't raise hell. And I said, that's not me, so I asked for a transfer to the Red Knights, and I became a Red Knight. And we went out with a bang when we went. Uh, that's just who we were. Uh, but, but, but we flew combat insertions. We took the troops into where the enemy was supposed to be. Uh, we had Cobra gunships as part of our unit. Usually you went in five slicks with five loads of troop at a time. You had a lead pilot and a, a trail pilot. You had a command and control ship that flew over with your Vietnamese counterparts with all the communication. And uh, you simply was a taxi taking guys in to and out of battle zones. Um, and we did our own medevacs, so if, if they got wounded, we went back in and picked up those guys and got them into the hospital. So the second month I'm there, we're working, um, Canto was directly south or south east of Ven Long, uh, probably a 45 minute flight. So we were working southeast of Canto out in some rice paddies and jungle areas. And we had taken the troops a couple of places and had actually inserted them into um, what was jungle at the time as when they jumped off of the helicopter they went up to their chest in water uh, and this was the LZ that the commanders had picked out and where we were told to put them and that's where we put them but I really felt sorry for these guys because they were in a bad physical location and they were not fighting VC this particular day our engagement was with North Vietnamese troops so we get these guys in and we're all out of fuel we're going back Canto to refuel and stand by to see if we need to take more troops in or if we need to extract the ones that we have. So the fighting's pretty heavy and we were listening on the radio to it and as we get probably 15 minutes from Canto we get a call that they have wounded that we need to go back and medevac out. So th that day I was flying with the, the aircraft, aircraft con commander who was flying trail, so trail being the last ship in the line was usually the one that turned around and went back and did the medevac. So we peeled off and went back to where we had inserted the troops. And as we went in, we took real heavy fire, automatic weapons, machine guns. Um, knew we were kind of in a, we had been in a lot of hot LZs and taken a lot of fire, but nothing quite like this that day. So we, we get three uh, South Vietnamese, South, South Vietnamese troops on board and as we take off we get maybe 150 200 feet and they literally just shoot us out of the sky uh, fuel cells are leaking half the radios are gone holes in the rotor uh, luckily none of us were hurt thank God uh, so our Cobras that were on station uh, vectored us as far away from the North Vietnamese troops as they could get us and uh, so we'd hopefully have time to be extracted. So we managed to set down okay without blowing up or burning because jet fuel was going everywhere and with a turbine engine with 1500 horsepower going, it's kind of tri tricky. Um, but we did get set down and I jump out and everybody, Tom mentioned the 45, I mean, we carried two or three extra weapons of your own personal weapons because they gave you a 38. And, you kept that between your legs in case you got shot through the bubble, it would maybe deflect a bullet. But uh, I get out and being the co-pilot, I'm handling all the guns for both me and the, and the pilot and he's trying to get the radios out and we've got all the code books and things. And the door gunner and the crew chief, uh, they set up a perimeter with their M60s and their handheld, which they love to do anyway. Um, so the North Vietnamese, they're coming, we're waiting, don't know what's going to happen, got no communications. The command and control ship, um, 
they're carrying our Vietnamese counterparts, the American commander, all the communication gear, and he thinks he wants to be brave and come in and rescue us. Well, there's four crew members and three wounded. You can't get seven people on his helicopter, and they almost shoot him down too, so he decides that's not a good idea. And uh, one of my good friends was flying lead that day, and he was one of the ones who, he's an old, one of the older pilots, uh, had been an enlisted man, went to flight school and got his warrant. Crazy guy, loved him to death, uh, Walter Penzen. Um, but he had just gotten the first of the new H model Hueys that we had. And they were like the difference between driving a Volkswagen and a Corvette. So he hears that we're down and, and knows what's going on. So he hands off to the number two ship and says, y'all go refuel, I'm going back. So he turns around, over torques the ship with everything he's got to get back to us. And uh, he comes in and picks us all up, uh, took real heavy fire coming in. So he picks us up and we get the wounded transferred over and then we take off. And as we're taking off, we almost get shot down again. Um, we took a bunch of hits. Um, this was probably the time I was most scared there because I wasn't actively doing anything. And I felt like somebody in a cardboard box that somebody with a deer rifle is shooting holes in. Because the bullets, this comes straight through a helicopter. There's no stopping them. And even the, one of the South Vietnamese troops that was wounded, his hand was maybe an inch or two. He was leaning over and his hand was in front of my knee and this, two of his fingers get shot off and he's got arterial blood going everywhere. So we bandage him up and put a compress on it and uh, all three of the Vietnamese got rewounded a second time. And not a single one of the American troops got a scratch. Another miracle. <laughs> but uh, we did manage to get out of the area. Um, but while we were waiting to be picked up, the Cobras had expended every round of ammunition, every rocket. They had zero ordnance, and these guys had their canopies up, and they were flying around with their 38 shooting uh, the North Vietnamese troops, hanging their butts out. And uh, as Tom said, you made some of the best friends you'll ever have in those circumstances. And, and these guys were hanging it out for us. Uh, they could just as well have hung back, but you know, to, to fly low and slow with your canopy up, shooting a pistol. And I can tell you from experience, shooting a pistol out of a helicopter is like throwing a BB at something you want to hurt. Uh, it was nothing, but it was, it was typical of the acts of bravery that you saw repeatedly. And so few people got recognized for it because it was your duty, it was part of what you were doing. But you made friends, these are the people who had your back, the people you trusted, the people you bonded with, and, and they, for the most part, always did have your back, and they depended on you to have theirs. And that's how you survive war. Um, it's a messy business. It involves killing people, wounding people, being wounded, being killed, having your friends killed being under constant pressure of knowing that you can die at any moment from a mortar or a rocket or a bullet. And the guys, I feel for the guys today in Iraq and Afghanistan because they're under that constant pressure. As Tom and them had booby traps, IEDs now are so much more, they, they do the same thing but to more people in a, in a, in a grosser manner. Uh, and these guys are going to suffer with these, and we as citizens have to be aware that they're going to need our help and support. Uh, brain injuries show up years after some of these guys get uh, blown up. Um, and, and what happens when you come back does matter. Um, all the previous wars that we had, you were greeted back as heroes. But for Vietnam veterans, you were treated like scum, and you really uh, weren't accepted back into society. And and a lot of the problems that we see, in a, and a lot of guys are dead. Uh, suicides, uh, not taking care of themselves, uh, being treated in a demeaning manner, um, it affects you psychologically. Uh, so if you didn't have that, what you had was your other veterans who were back home already 
Um, and with them, you you were still bonded. You were all veterans. You you had been there, so you formed your own society, um, and you didn't really care about the general public's society anymore. We had been rejected, so it was no problem for us to reject their morals or their beliefs and to say we're going to do what we do, which is celebrate every day we're alive and we don't care. We'll do whatever, uh, sex, drugs, rock and roll. Um, so eventually even that wears thin and uh, luckily um, met, uh, well I should mention that the, the great treatment we got when we came back is flew into California, came in about two o'clock, unloaded from the plane, got a cold steak, got your medical exams the next day, and you were a civilian the day after that. Uh, so it was a, an abrupt transition without any preparation or thought to the problems you were going to deal with when you got back home. Um, so that was a very strange period in time. The 70s, if you look at historical uh, vintage videos of that time with the war protest, um, with people fighting the National Guard and the National Guard killing civilians. It, it, it made us all less. We were all demeaned by the process. And I understood it. I, I went to Vietnam knowing that we probably had no chance. And, and once you were there, within six weeks of, of fighting what was going on, you knew we were not going to win the war. So in essence, we were no longer fighting a winnable war, we were just killing people. And body count became the main statistic that people looked at. How many people have you killed? And yes, I was a hunter before I went. I, you know, I loved to hunt quail and dove and rabbits and squirrels. But once you've hunted people that shoot back at you, it's different and it, you can't undo it and you can't go back. Um, so it, it involves things that we as human beings have to examine, need to examine, and be more cautious before making war. Uh, but, but you knew inherently, and, I, and I, Tom and I have never talked about this, but I, I knew after six weeks of what was going on who had the better Army. We were, we were helping the South Vietnamese and, and the American de, uh, demilitarization was going on. We were transitioning over. But they were not capable of carrying the load without the American support and the troops there. So what we became in essence was no longer warriors in a war, but killers that we later became branded as. And, and that stigma stuck. And, and now we're seeing acts by the general public and the citizenry to try and correct this, uh, which is good. Um, but 40 years after, don't do a whole lot to change what it was. Um, but anyway, came back um, from the war, three years of hedonism, and met my wife, who probably saved my life. Uh, went back to college, uh, Appalachian to major in art, discovered that if you're going to be an artist, you might need something to make a living with. So uh, <laughs> GI Bill again, agree with Tom, GI Bill was a wonderful thing. Uh, so I ended up going to Lenore Ryan, uh, actually got a free ride there, uh, made the dean's list. I had several 4.0 semesters, majored in sociology and religion. Graduated, uh, worked in a furniture company hacking lumber with a friend till I found a job and while I was ending up school, uh, got hired to work for DSS in 1979. And at that time, amazing enough, I had a full beard that hung down and I could have passed for the Taliban who were unknown <laughs> then. And uh, lucky um, Miss Nan Campbell, God love her, she's a saint. Uh, looked at me and saw maybe something worth hiring and hired me and uh, I worked child support for 21 years and then transitioned over to another program we were piloting for the state, uh, a non-custodial parent employment program, did that for two and a half or three years and then uh, 
got transitioned over to my current job, which is a uh, human resource placement specialist with the Work First Unit, a bunch of saints themselves. Um, but um, have seen the underbelly of what poverty and uh, greed and the things that we still have to find ways to deal with in our society because we're on the cusp of losing not only our liberties but our freedom of work and freedom of thought. Um, these are in jeopardy to a point that most people don't realize. Um, we, we have to deal with these issues. You, the weakest link, a, a rope is only as strong as its weakest link. And society is much the same way. Uh, we have two uh, differing opinions on how you deal with it now. They're tied to the same political actions that make war. Um, God bless the soldiers. They do jobs that have to be done to preserve our freedom. But they are at the mercy and will of the military industrial complex. And the military industrial complex, as President Eisenhower told us in the 50s, is, an, is, a, is a vast organization worldwide that profits from war. And they only profit if they sell guns and bullets and weapons of war and aircraft. And we've learned to kill each other in so many different ways and so effectively that we now have the capability of killing all life on Earth with atomic weapons. Is this what we want as a people? Um, and I think soldiers who, who have been to war and people like you who took care of those who were wounded in war understand the reality and the effects long term of what war does to people. You would think it's a natural part of what we are because we're so prone to do it. But studies have shown the detrimental of effects of killing and of war go far deeper and last much longer than we had thought previously. It harms us and lessens us in ways that as children of God, we should not be. And we have lost the joy of living. We escape our reality with videos and living on the web or watching movies to escape or alcohol or drugs. These are all ways that people treat themselves to feel better. We don't get our enjoyment and fulfillment from our work and from our lives that we have built in a manner that satisfies us any longer. Much like the food that we eat no longer has the nutritional properties of food that was raised on soil that was kept renewed. And all these things are connected because life itself is connected. And as, as Chad and I were talking a minute ago, there, there are subatomic particles that can communicate instantaneously over infinite distance. So all life communicates all the time. And, and, and the Bible itself says that whatsoever we bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and what we loosen in heaven will be loosened on earth. So what we think or what we dream of or what we visualize for ourselves as human beings is what we will create. If we cannot envision it, we can't do it. We have, who've been to war understand that it's not a way of life that benefits humanity. So how do we change this? How do we affect this change? We're all citizens. We're all part of the fabric of this country. This country is about the citizens. Should I say it used to be about that? Now it's about how can we give more benefits to our politicians who seem to have no concern about the people who are floundering without help because we have allowed 1% of our population to control more than 90% of the wealth. I don't believe in taking it away from it. They earned it, but they earned it in ways that were dishonest. Our, our government, our congressmen and our senators have just finally stopped themselves from doing insider trading, which means you're taking unfair advantage of the market. If they were doing it, their friends were doing it. So we have control of a free market that's no longer 
free and I'm wandering off the subject we're talking on. I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it's who I am, so I, I apologize. Uh, so you can bring us back on track if you wish. <laughs> um, were any of your uh, family members or ancestors, were they previously in the military? Uh, yes, I had quite a few of uh, family who were in the military. Uh, my father's brothers were in World War II also. Um, I had, uh, I think I have an uncle on one side or other who was in the Korean War, uh, but not too many went to Vietnam. I guess they saw me do it and figured it was stupid. Why do we want to do that? Um, but uh, no, not not really a, a military family. My family on both sides were farmers and loggers and uh, people who worked for a living on the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, no, not a whole lot of military. My father, uh, being a World War II vet, unfortunately uh, got burned out before I was born and all of his military uniforms, paperwork, everything was destroyed. And it's one of those events that, that maybe change or nudge what happens in life, but I was not exposed to that much military input from him. He didn't talk about it. and. Uh, you barely knew who was in it, so no, I got mine from books and reading and, and daydreaming about what life was about. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, but no, it's, um, no, I, I'm just, it was a soldier because I got drafted. Did you um, keep any of your uniforms or military mementos or anything like that? I still have those actually. My father passed away uh, last year and I'm in the process of trying to get all that stuff from his house where it's been stored. So uh, I have it, don't know what in the world I'm going to do with it, but dress blues and all the, all the uniforms I have. So I will probably keep those just as a memento and uh, took a lot of photographs while we were there. Uh, being pilots, we, we had time, it, it was two people to fly, so one would fly, and if you weren't taking fire, and even if you were, sometimes you had the camera taking photos, so uh, got a lot of nice photos of uh, what we were seeing and, and what the war uh, looked like from, from the front seat of a Huey. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but it, it was not all bad, it, it was beautiful country. I, I, had the good fortune, I, I suppose we would define it as good fortune, but with 13 days left in country, uh, we were going into Laos and the, the South Vietnamese were just getting their butts kicked and helicopters shot down. So every unit that had extra helicopters that were flyable were sending them to the DMZ for their push into uh, Laos. So I got to transport a ship, got to, ordered to, uh, ferry a, a, a ship to the, the DMZ, so we actually flew up the coast of South Vietnam, which was one of the most beautiful places on earth. I mean, it was fabulous. Uh, outstanding beaches. Uh, so we flew up the coast all the way to the DMZ, and, and actually I got to visit with a friend of mine from Taylorsville who was uh, with a medevac unit, uh, Mr. Danny Hendren, now a local insurance agent. but. Um, I got to overnight where he was based and we got together for one night. Uh, so that was one of two friends I got to see while I was in, in Vietnam. Um, so most, most of it was brothers you made there and uh, people you went into combat with. These became your family. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what you, your life was centered there. You, you didn't dream too much about back home because you really had no clue if you were going to come back and you, you didn't want to plan ahead for something that you know might jinx it so it was one day at a time pretty much and uh, you got up each day and if you were flying combat missions today's a good day to die as any and let's go do it and if you were flying ash and trash uh, we also did resupply for a lot of the outpost um, a lot of different units in different places uh, delivered the mail supplies ammo um, UPS. Uh, we were taxi drivers and ups, dri ups drivers combined um, for very low pay, um, but but it was different. I'd, we we can't regret the path that brings us to enlightenment, and for any of us to say that we'd be the same person whether or not 
we experience war and the effects of war, I think you would agree it changes you. You see the world in a different way, not a worse way. You understand that humans are capable of many things, and I saw great acts of compassion. I saw great acts of bravery for which there was no recognition. I saw hate. I saw bigotry. So whatever you look for in life, you find it was a mix. Uh, war, the, one of the problems that a lot of us had coming back, uh, and speaking for myself and, and the, the buddies we ran around with, but you were hooked on adrenaline. At some point, the excitement, there, there's no drug that's stronger than adrenaline. Mm -hmm. And when you are used to tapping into that, because when people shoot at you, you get a little adrenaline rush. And it takes hours and hours and hours to get it out of your system. And if you're doing it multiple times a day, as we were, we would, you know, get up and just cranking uh, one of those helicopters, the sound, and, and cranking a turbine engine, uh, a jet engine process in itself. Then the noise you get, I still get heartbeats when helicopters fly over. Um, but you're, you're going in and out, you're picking up troops, you're multiple times into a um, combat zone, dropping troops, and then in the afternoons you were going back doing the same thing in reverse. So you would get adrenaline and then you would rest and then you get more. So you, you really became hooked on that. It, it was war and if you're, if you're going to fight war, you have to be the best you can be at it. You, you go joyously into war. Uh, you got to put fear behind you, not that you don't get afraid. But you face it, and you put on a good face, and you go do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what soldiers do, and that's what our troops today are doing. Uh, but the adrenaline and, and, and the decompression from war, we didn't have, so we all came back looking for something to do. So a lot of us took up motorcycles and uh, riding like maniacs and standing up on the seats with our arms out. And, <laughs> Uh, dangerous things that gave you that adrenaline rush you needed. Uh, you know, riding down the highway under a full moon, five or six people with your headlights off, going 60 miles an hour, uh, gives you a thrill. And and motorcycles was as close as we could get to helicopters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so we. And it is. And and you didn't. You'd been in life and death situations so many times that hanging your butt out and your backside out and possibly being killed doing it didn't really play into it. Mm -hmm. I survived the war. I'm immortal. Mm -hmm. uh, so it made for wild times in wild times. Uh, society was in turmoil. It was a flux that really, I don't know if we'll ever see it again. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the number of people who were protesting who didn't want to go to Vietnam, with very valid reasons. We now know that the Gulf of Tonkin was a, a setup. We know that we were placed in the war without sufficient reason. Um, so we should learn from our mistakes, but I don't see us learning a lot. Our politicians still play with power as though it's their God-given right to sacrifice the lives of innocent people to make war that accomplish nothing. If you're gonna go to war, I was competitive. I was an athlete and I always fought to make good grades. You always did the best you could under whatever circumstances you were in. But in Vietnam, it didn't matter how good you did what you did. You weren't going to win. There were, they, it couldn't be done. The French couldn't do it. We were fighting troops that had been at war for decades. They had tunnels, they had preparations. They were, in the scenarios that we were in, they were undefeatable because we did not care to drop an atomic bomb on North Vietnam and obliterate them which we would have had to have done. So if you can't win a war, and these advisors who advise our president and the Joint Chiefs of Staff and all them, we need to have a valid reason 
and some hope that we're going to win this war. But we did the same thing in Iraq. We didn't really win. We got them ready as we said they needed to be, and we left. We sh I'm not sure that we should have been there in the first place. Uh, Afghanistan, have we accomplished a whole lot? Uh, they're a tribal country based with uh, warlords. Don't know that they're ever going to have a non-corrupt centralized government. Um, can we win? Could Russia? Russia was close. Could Russia defeat them? No. Uh, you can't win a war that people aren't willing to die themselves to gain liberty. That's how we did it. People died in the Revolutionary War. Uh, they were willing to give up everything for the ideals of freedom, which is what our military is about, mm -hmm. or should be. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the reasons I suppose that Vietnam veterans had such a readjustment was we knew we had been made losers. Personally, I hate to lose. I didn't like being branded a loser. Kind of joined Custer, and I didn't have a lot of respect for Custer because he was fairly stupid. Uh, so we have dealt with it. A lot of guys are dead and gone. I lost another veteran friend two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, the thing that's worrisome now, as Tom and I both know, was the exposure to Agent Orange. All of us live with that hanging over our head. Uh, all the, the repercussions from the use of it have not been discovered. They're adding diseases and cancers and new problems that have arisen from its use continually. Um, Tom has problems with it. I have problems with it. So you've got a, a shoe waiting to fall from a war that happened 40 some years ago that's still affecting people. Mm -hmm. And like Tom, I must say that the VA, uh, both our local office, tremendous help. Uh, the VA hospital, I go to Asheville. Um, they give the best service they can and I've not had bad service other than on an orthopedic matter and I, I fully understand why. But they're, they're treating like 35,000 people at one hospital. That's phenomenal if you look at it, but you can't give first-rate care to 35,000 people at one hospital. You can try, and these people are so whipped and so beat down by the caseloads and the work they're trying to do that I feel sorry for them. Uh, I understand their position. So, so when I go, I go prepared to, to, to whatever time it takes. I'm, I take a book, I read. I don't put undue expectations on them, so I'm not disappointed. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're doing the best they can. And our local offices, which you now hold, and Barbara Poole held before, have helped lots and lots of veterans get benefits that they needed, that they were entitled to. So thank you very much for what you do. Yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> and I also appreciate your service. Uh, so, um, but um, that's Phil's story. Uh, it's still going on. Uh, More daily. So what would you have to say to the youth of today? Oh, Lord. <laughs> Learn the definition of liberty and freedom and determine if these are things you would give your life for. If you aren't willing to die or sacrifice for these principles, then you will give them up too easily. Uh, respect our military and understand their value and what they do. Get an education, study in school, Please don't have babies before it's your time in life. Uh, learn from the mistakes of the past. Love the earth, take care of it. It's where we live, it's our planet. Without it, we have nothing. So let's all reconnect with nature, with what God has created for us to live in, and what ultimately, if you are a Christian, you look and God created man to take care of the garden. So let's build a new garden. Let's make the earth a true Eden. Let's figure out how to live peacefully with one another, to love one another, 
respect one another, and live as our Creator intended. Thank you very much for this interview. It's been very interesting. Thank and thank you so much for your service to our country. Thank you. Okay, Phil, I see you brought some pictures today. How about telling us a little bit about what you brought? Yes, ma'am. Be happy to. Uh, Kind of beginning uh, at Fort Walters, Texas, where we began flight training. This is the entrance, and this helicopter that you can see here, which looks like a, a miniature, which it really was, was a TH-55, uh, room for two passengers, you and your instructor pilot. And that's what we actually began flying in, and this then is one of the Hueys that we flew in Vietnam. Uh, we did troop insertions and extractions, and we did our own medevacs for the wounded. Uh, we didn't have a medevac unit per se that did it, so we picked up our own wounded. And uh, This is one of the villages that um, when we did troop pickups, we'd pick them up at different local locations and carry them to where the mission was for the day. So I got a few pictures of some villages uh, mm -hmm. in the area and, and some of the native uh, villages. And, and this is what a typical uh, village down in the delta uh, looked like it was the uh, the grain producing area for rice uh, for most of vietnam mm -hmm. um, this is one of the photos um, excuse the dress but uh, this is what it was like in monsoon season every afternoon you'd get rain for four or five hours it would flood everything over because it was very flat uh, but actually this was my room right here on the corner uh, you had concrete walls around and there was a concrete barrier here which effectively held the water once the level, you can see here it's gone down about four inches already, but once the water outside went away, the inside of your hooch was still full of water and Mama San would come in the next day and bail water and um, we'd do it all again that afternoon. But this is what it looked like during monsoon when the flood air season was there. Uh, everything was just water as far as you could see. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of the combat assault missions we did. Um, five or six uh, insertions a day, depending on the number of troops that we were carrying, and then we would go somewhere and wait if it was going to be a one-day operation, and we'd go back in late afternoon and pick up the troops and take them back to their base camp. Um, this is a photo of the ship that I got shot down in first uh, when they brought it back in. Um, it was pretty tore up, but uh, we all survived. Uh, the, as we told you, I think, in our interview before, the three wounded uh, troops that we had picked up all got rewounded on our extraction. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is what we did, um, just sat around out uh, between missions after we had the troops all put in. We'd hang around and uh, play with the kids and, and enjoy the local scenery and they have a pig there. I was going to say, uh, <laughs> is that a pig? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then, then when they got ready or they needed somebody medevaced out, one person might medevac, but then in the afternoons, if it was a one-day mission, we'd go back in and pick them up and take mm -hmm. them back to base. Um, uh, one of the villages, one of the great things about flying was you got to see more of Vietnam from the air, and, and some of the, I had to remember this was a French uh, protectorate at one time, and they had some beautiful cities and beautiful villages, and this is one of the more pristine ones. Uh, another shot of the hooch during the dry season, so you can see the, the barrier I was talking about before. Uh, but these are two of our mama sons. You'd pay them a certain amount of money each day to uh, polish your boots and uh, clean up the hooches. And they were lovely ladies. We all took good care of them. Another picture of one of the local villages. Um, I think this might have been a Buddhist temple here. Mm -hmm. um, and these are the bad lighting cause it was nighttime, but this was the initiation. If you think college hazing was bad, uh, Vietnam hazing was really bad, but they <laughs> would cook up a, a dish of everything from fried oysters, anything edible but smell bad, and they would cook it all day while you were out. And you came back at night and you had to drink, eat a full cup of it, and here's what you usually did with it. You threw it right back up because it was totally repugnant. Then strip you down to your underwear, and you had to go through the drainage ditches in a race. The last person had to go again, and they would pour oil on you or other things while you were running the race. But that was what you had to do to be accepted in there, and it was it was not that horrible, uh, but it wasn't fun. Um, this was my ship when I got a new H model, my crew chief, um, and some of the kids that would come around uh, in our time between missions. Um, another look here of one of the downtown areas. Uh, 
I got to see a lot of several cities downtown, especially we'd go into lunch and eat at the Mac V compounds a lot of times, so we got to see a lot of places. Uh, this is the revetment at Vin Long where you kept your helicopters at night. Mm -hmm. uh, this whole airfield, uh, one of the hard things that you had to get used to was sleeping with helicopters and airplanes going, taking off and landing 24 hours a day. Um, the time I was there, 70 and 71, was during the Vietnamization period of the war. So the troops that we dealt mostly with for South Vietnamese regular army. Mm -hmm. uh, we loved to fly Americans on missions because we got things done, but we were uh, Vietnamizing the war and, and towards the end we're actually helping train their pilots also. Mm -hmm. Another uh, local picture, you can see the rice that they traded a lot in. Uh, their economy uh, was pretty elementary as far as basic needs of the people, but did get to see a lot of the cities. Mm -hmm. um, entertainment shows, we, we were lucky and uh, got entertainment once in a while and this was a Filipino group that came and uh, titillated the troops. <laughs> um, this is a picture of, of one of uh, the times that Mama San brought crayfish in for us and uh, this would be me right here. And uh, excellent food, nice ladies you can tell, they were, they were happy to be there. Uh, another one of a combat insertion, you can see the troops, a lot of times we put them out into five foot high grass, sometimes water up to their chest. Uh, I did not envy their their jobs, but usually you had five helicopters in a in a group when we made insertions, mm -hmm. and we had two Cobra gunships that flew uh, <clears throat> guns for us. And this you can see the smoke is from the rockets that the Cobras had already laid down, and, and we were making insertions into a fairly open area, which was good because you get five ships in a tight LZ, and it gets to be quite a task. Right. Um, but we did have an officer's club. Uh, the girls there were not hookers or anything else. They were there to serve you drinks and uh, some beautiful young ladies. And actually this girl married this guy and came back to the States with him. Um, she was a, a super nice lady. Mm -hmm. um, this one I'll turn so you can see it, but this was combat field there, uh, downtown. But, we did have some off time. If you flew too many hours in the first couple of months we were there, we overflew the hours uh, mm -hmm. quite a bit, and you you got grounded for several days till you were eligible to fly again. Again, another uh, one of the local areas. We worked the whole Delta region from the Yumen Forest down south to the Seven Sisters Mountains on the Cambodian border. Uh, but this was during the time we were waiting to take the troops back out. And it, probably had been monsoon season or getting ready to start. You can see the rain clouds. Mm -hmm. But um, domestic crops here, rice, uh, different things that they had. This is some of the crazy red nights. Um, brothers all, I mean, when you were there, these people had your back and you, you always looked out for each other. Mm -hmm. And you always made sure you were friends with the Cobra pilots because they were the ones who protected you when you were out there. Um, another downtown, uh, Photo. I think this was an actual Vin Long here, um, but it was interesting. Uh, there was not that much danger of being assaulted or anything when you were downtown because there were usually a lot of GIs there, so you felt relatively safe. Mm -hmm. uh, and I actually kept an apartment downtown Vin Long for a couple of months. Um, this is the orphanage at Vin Long, uh, one of the sadder parts of the war, but these were all the orphans. And a lot of times we'd go down and try and do some things for the orphanage there. And actually, when I first got there, they had a swimming pool that, that they let us use, but mm -hmm. it, it wasn't be able to be maintained. Um, this was after the, the harvest of the rice. They burned all the uh, rice uh, straw and everything, and it would be the whole delta would be smoky from from that. You could you could follow smoke, and know where you were anytime. Mm -hmm. um, another photo of the officers' club. Um, just a personal shot. And these are four of the slicks in front. I think I was flying trail that day, so when you were in the back end, you could photograph the guys in front of you. Right. Um, but a lot of what we went in was tree lines and, and semi-jungle. Um, that's where your danger was, and that's where the VC or the North Vietnamese usually had their positions. Um, but this shows you the delta during monsoon season. It's just one large flooded area. But all these are rice paddies uh, that they will plant the rice in. And another photo of that showing how minuscule we really were in, in relation to the land. Mm -hmm. um, 
And these were the Seven Sisters Mountains. Uh, anytime you flew by there, you're always in danger of taking fire. Uh, they had a lot of caves. Um, dropped the B-52s, dropped a lot of bombs, a lot of oil and stuff in the caves, but didn't do much in wiping them out. Mm -hmm. A coastal shot, we worked with the seals down in the Yumen Forest, um, which was an experience. I'm not going into it now, but <laughs> those were some crazy guys. Uh, the best ever. We loved the seals. Uh, but the, the beaches in Vietnam were some of the most beautiful beaches, some of the most beautiful land anywhere mm -hmm. I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, but another shot of uh, one of the downtown areas, that, and I don't remember which one this was because I don't read Vietnamese and I didn't write it on the back of the photographs. Um, but another picture of the Seven Sisters Mountain and one of the MACV compounds that was there. And um, then this was downtown Vietnam. This was a little outdoor restaurant where you could go and eat outdoors. Mm -hmm. And the Mekong River was running here. And they were always fishermen or boat traffic. A lot of boat people in this area, as, as you would expect, with a lot of water. Uh, but we would go here and sometimes eat the local food and uh, watch them fish and yeah. see what was going on. Um, this is the grim reminder of what war is ultimately. Uh, dead people, blood right. and guts, and yeah. that's what you're there to do, and that's what you have to do. Uh, it's not easy to remember, but it's what war is all about and one reason we should always try whenever possible not to go to war unless it's something that is worth fighting for. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this was one of my favorite crews. This actually was the crew that I got shot down with. This was uh, Ballesteri who was the chief pilot or the uh, aircraft commander at the time and we we're just showing off with some of the guns. Tom I think in his interview was talking about personal weapons everybody carried personal weapons because you never knew when one was going to jam. Right. Uh, and this was me before the war, or during the war when I was home on the leave and I was a cowboy at the time. And uh, it, uh, very happy I survived with most of me intact. And uh, then uh, this was a young lady I spent some time with when I was in downtown Ben Long. So that's the story. <laughs> In short, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.